Okay, take two. The battery went dead on me. Take one. I'm doing a studio tour before I make some changes to the control room here. I'm in the live room right now. Um, basically, uh, you can see my Mesa Boogie Mark IV right there. Uh, there's a lot of trains in this room now because I have uh, not been doing studio work for many years, but I do plan on doing it for myself very shortly. And we're going into the control room. So let's do that. As you first walk in, uh, you'll see this is the uh, arrangement of the studio. There's two mixtures side by side, and I'll give you a tour of that in a second, as soon as I close this door. Okay, so now what we have here is an Allen Heath 2400 console, GL2400, 32 channels. And right alongside of it is the Personas 32S model with moving faders and uh, DAW control. And it might be hard to make out, but there's the control room glass. You're looking at the studio lit up in there, which is no longer a live room per se, like the old days. Uh, it's more of a hobby room with trains, etc. But it's still plenty of room to uh, record a band if I wanted to. And we have some monitors here. <clears throat> They're temporarily uh, in the studio because my JBLs need to be repaired. And I do plan on buying possibly uh, some inline, uh, excuse me, Cali Audio inline 8 I believe it's called or 8 inline I'm not sure what they call them anyway what we have up here starting from the top is an oral exciter type C that's by Afix and then we have the much bigger brother type 3 exciter with all those controls I believe there's seven per channel plus a lot of push buttons under that we have quad gates by Audiologic MT44 and underneath that, we have the Auto Quad, which is a frequency selective gate. Works very well for keeping the uh, snare uh, uh, clean from the hi-hat signal. You can gate the hi-hat out of there. And then we have a vintage Yamaha 2020 compressor. Underneath that, we have a DBX-166, which is a really nice compressor for a mid-range compressor. Then we have the uh, TC Electronic 1144, which is basically a four band fully sweepable and also has bandwidth fully parametric actually. Uh, EQ, which this one actually uh, is designed for a bass, but they're actually identical to the one that's just labeled as a, an EQ. Under that we have a multi effects unit Another vintage unit by ART, that's the SGE with all these purpley things on there. I don't know why they do all that stuff, I guess to make it more sellable. Underneath that we have the Yamaha, I'm sorry, not Yamaha, that's uh, not yet. We have the Korg A3, let me get out of the light. And that's a multi-effects unit also with some killer distortions in there. And uh, right below that is the SBX 900 by Yamaha. Probably got that around uh, early 90s. Also considered vintage now. A lot of these things are vintage in this rack, as a matter of fact. And then we have the uh, Lexicon PCM 42 with the blue there. That's a digital delay. Underneath that we have the Yamaha Rev 7, another vintage piece. And then we have probably uh, the most ex expensive effect that I have in the rack would be the Eventide H3000 with those yellow soft keys there. That's the f and then underneath that, of course, uh, we have a 24-track de dedicated digital recorder by Alesis. It's the HD24XR model, which has the higher sampling rate converters up to 96K. And below that, we have another compressor because I couldn't fit it in the top, uh, DBX-166. And over here we have the patch bay. And I actually have more patch bays on the other rack system. Um, alongside of that, we have the Alesis remote control that I use. This is a BRC that is used to control the HD24XR. It happens to work with that even though it was designed for the ADATs. Okay. Now over here, we have a Roland JW50 keyboard. 
And actually, uh, let me digress. Up the top, we have a really old vintage Sony recorder that I got many, many years ago. And let me move this out of the way here. I got the uh, cover off right now because I was tinkering with it a while back. It's the TC353. And actually has a power amp built into it. The fader knobs are over there on top of the console area. Uh, so you can drive speakers that come with it. The speakers are actually are not in the room, but they're, uh, the whole thing folds into one unit. Anyway, back to the JW50. Here it is. It's got a sequencing built in. Believe it or not, it uses a uh, floppy disk because it's of that era. It's a little hard to see. I'm blocking the light. Okay, over here, we'll start for some vintage Ibanez, Ibanez uh, multi-effects. This is the UE405. I hope the light is not too bad. I should try to get out of the way of the light. And above that, we have a pair of Ibanez Digital Delays, DM1000s. They are great for guitar. I never tried using them on vocals, but I used to use one of these uh, live all the time with the uh, 405, which is on the bottom. And the other one I bought on eBay probably 10 years ago. Above that, we have a, uh, a headphone amp by Behringer. I think it's called the PowerPlay. It's in excellent shape. Got a great deal on eBay to drive headphones. Never actually used it, but I did test it. Above that, we have a programmable Digitech Dual 14 EQ. You can keep things different curves, EQ curves in memory. Then we have a Sabine uh, guitar tuner on top of that. And we have a music spike with multiple outlets on the back of uh, on top of that. Uh, the outlets are on the back. And there's another patch bay over there, which I actually bought very early on. I never use it. It's not really a high-end one like the Furman's. And then we have a vintage Tascam 122 cassette recorder. Uh, people don't use cassettes anymore, but it's nice to have it. Uh, it does record at two speeds, regular cassette speed, and also uh, it'll record at three and a half inches per second. Under that, we have a Roland U220. Um, that's a lot of different keyboard sounds. And underneath that, we have a Sony DAT recorder. Uh, that is a PCM R500. And under that, we have another DAT recorder, which used to be the uh, industry standard as far as uh, mixing down to DAT. This is the Tascam DA30. And we also have another Tascam unit. It's an 8-track digital machine, DA88, that I used to sync via Simpty. This one has the Simpty card in there. Which I used to sync it to my uh, Tascam ATR6016 16, 16 track running on 1 inch tape, which could actually record either at 15 inches per second or 30 inches per second of tape. And we have just some stereo gear over here, another couple of cassette recorders, and a power amp. There's a power amp over there. Uh, we have some speakers, those are home speakers that are just make, making a table actually to, to hold some other gear here. We have a couple of drum machines, Yamahas. Boss multi effects. We have a uh, well sought after Robert Keeley modded DS1 boss pedal. Said mint shape. I almost sold it. I'm glad I didn't. RE20 right here, microphone. An old Vox. I'm sorry, not Vox. It's a uh, Vox. Well, the Vox actually, we might as well do that one. It's way over there. That's actually a tone bender. Uh, really vintage from the late 60s. Um, I will be uh, working on that to put a battery. Uh, connector uh, soldering one in because it came off years ago. And we have an old Gibson Maestro wah-wah pedal. And here we have a Mesa Boogie, um, uh, I'm trying to think of the name of a throttle box, I believe it is. Uh, I should have removed it from the box, but uh, let me see, maybe I can open it up. There it is in there. That's brand new. I, I uh, basically only use it once at a jam session. It's, it's a great uh, uh, accoutrement to the uh, Mesa Boogie Mark IV. And we'll leave that for for now. And here's a uh, custom boutique amp that was made in Arizona. Uh, it's a one-off uh, made by a great company called Red Plate. Um, you probably, my shadow is kind of in the way here with the way the lighting is, but you can get an idea. It has an Alnico, Alnico speaker in it, which uh, we, a friend of mine helped me put in there. Uh, we took out the Celestion Vintage 30, which is also a great speaker, but it's ceramic magnet. The Alnicos have a certain sound, as most audio people would know. Just some uh, <laughs> overflow stuff that needs to be cleaned up, including a lot of battery chargers, etc. 
There's some JBL Control 1s, I guess they're called, or is it Control 5? I forget. Control 1. Uh, they need to be, um, the speakers need to be repaired because the foam surround deteriorated over the years. And there's a subwoofer made by a JBL right behind it, which is hard to make out. Uh, a lot of old vintage quarter inch tapes that I used to record on that Sony recorder. And we have some train stuff here because I'm t heavily into model trains. Here's a trestle I built years ago. Uh, it's basically finished. I just have to stain it, but I don't have a place for, for it on the layout yet, so I haven't actually stained it. I have a lot of brand new cables and headphones up here. Uh, you never know when you need extra cables. And I also have a lot of cables here that I used to use with my DNR Orion console. These are all made by me. And a bunch of patch cables over here. This is a rack unit that I made to hold my 10 point auto locator for the Tascam recorder. It has some wires here, multi track wires with uh, nitric connectors hanging over it. There's a Les Paul in one case there, and there's also another Gibson, uh, Gibson 135. Uh, they're both unusual models because the uh, Les Paul they only made three years with the three pickups with the, like a strap and the other the other guitar has closed F holes. They only made it for one year and I believe it was 2001. I should say that I used to have over here where the console is, I used to have this console right here. This is a photo of a DNR Orion. That used to be sitting right, hopefully you can make it out with the glare. That used to be sitting right here where these two consoles are. Uh, I sold that about five years ago. It's a great console, super clean. Used used to advertise it. Actually, they, it was rated with Pro Audio Magazine as quiet as a Neve. Didn't have the functionality of a, of a Neve, of course, but um, and it was a lot cheaper, of course, also. But uh, it, not that it was cheap, mind you. Uh, but a uh, great console. Um, I just decided to move it because it was like almost 300 pounds. If something went wrong, you just can't pick it up and bring it to a repair shop. Let's see what here's an old Thorns turntable. I have the, uh, the cartridge off right now to protect it. It's in this box over here. Uh, this thing is really cool. It has a strobe light over here for setting the speed up. It's got counterweights. It's, it's a really cool turntable. It hasn't been used in years. You can probably tell by the amount of dust on there. Okay, so what else do we have here? Uh, if I were, well, it's very hard to get an idea with the, with the backlighting over there. Um, there's more train stuff over here. Here's a, a turntable that I built from scratch. Uh, nothing to do with audio, but uh, the overflow uh, is all over the place when you have limited space in a house. There's an old microphone also. And some of the Sony recorder parts are over here that I have to, the knobs I have to put back on. I will be tearing this section out. That's why basically I'm documenting this, this whole rack system out. And I'm going to utilize these. There's two there. They're angled with a parquet top, which is a little hard to see. You can see, see another one over here. This used to be one long four bay rack system, but it was too hard to move around, so I actually cut it in two. Um, and I'm going to put that right behind the console with the patch bay in between. So this way, hopefully, all the wiring that I have currently uh, will be uh, long enough. And um, basically, uh, all these cables here. Well, actually, no. These these are these are the professional uh, re-end connector ones. I didn't make these. Um, they're actually in another box. Come to think of it, but a lot of the ones I made are here. But there's hun there's hundreds of cables that I had made from scratch uh, with with a soldering iron. It's very tedious, but it's worth the effort. This basically the studio has a star grounding system, and you see these gr green grounding wires. They're running into the ceiling. And they're all terminated. <clears throat> well, hold on. I'll have to come behind here. So, a lot of wiring. You can see, well, let me get out of the light. See all these green cables? Those are grounding wires. Um, and they're all bundled together with wire ties. Put that over there. And they're running up there. I don't know if you can see them. You see these terminal strips? There's three of them, I believe. They, yeah, three or four, no, three. And uh, basically, um, there's one really thick wire there. That runs out to the back of the house. Ouch, woo, watch out for that. And uh, see the grounding wire up there? It's running along here, and actually it terminates outside with a grounding rod driven into the ground like three feet deep. 
And the whole house is fully alarmed in case anybody's watching this. Okay. And every single window and door. So basically, there's the other side of the studio a little bit. The light's a little bright. But, um... Yeah, you get an idea. Okay. And I will be signing off, I guess. And I'll try not to trip over this again. Okay, so signing off. Mark, hello in Tennessee. Hope you're doing well. And uh, we'll talk soon. Okay, signing off. From New Jersey.